Hello, everyone, and welcome to this year's first My IBD Learning Virtual Program, IBD Medications Now and Beyond. So I'll just introduce myself real quick. My name is Nathan, and I will be the moderator for today's session. I'm a member of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's National Council of College Leaders, and I'm also an IBD patient myself. So I'm very excited to hear from our panelists today, and I hope you all are as well. So each of this year's My IBD Learning virtual programs will focus on the topic of how to achieve IBD remission. Prior to each program, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation polls the community over social media to determine what topics in remission are most important to you. So you chose and we listened. And with that being said, I'm excited to announce that our first program of the year will be focusing on IBD medications. So in recent years, treatment options for IBD have expanded. And the goal of these newer medications is to reduce inflammation, which can greatly improve one's quality of life. So tonight, you'll be hearing an overview of the most effective IBD treatment strategies now available, as well as learn more about approaches to treatment in the future. So before we start, I just wanna remind everybody really quick that the information shared today is for educational purposes only and should not replace any advice or guidance from your own healthcare professional. Um, additionally, the program today will be recorded and posted on the My IBD Learning website, www.cronescolitisfoundation.org slash My IBD Learning. And everyone who's registered for today's program will also receive a link with the recording next week. And one more important point, we want this to be as interactive and engaging as possible, so we encourage you to submit your questions to the Q&A box, which can be found at the lower part of your screen. Uh, and then following our expert discussion, I'll be moderating a Q&A session with our panelists, and we'll try to address as many of those questions as we can. So as you guys can see on the screen now, our two extra expert presenters today are Dr. Gori Kanajedi and Dr. Jeannie Huang. So Dr. Conagetti is a gastroenterologist specializing in IBD, including Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis at Scripps Clinic in San Diego. She joined Scripps Clinic in 2014 after completion of her GI fellowship and now serves as the director of the IBD program. In addition to her clinical practice, Dr. Conagetti is actively involved in IBD education and research and has received funding for her research in IBD diet and nutrition, as well as cancer screening. Dr. Jeannie Huang is the medical director of the IBD Center at Rady Children's Hospital. She's also a professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Huang has been a longtime proponent of the need to prepare youth for the transition from pediatric to adult-centered care, and Rady's has an active transition education program for everyone who receives care at their IBD Center. And we'll just leave our speaker's disclosures on screen for a moment. All right, now let's get, to start, let's get started with tonight's conversation on IBD medications now and beyond. <clears throat> All right, so patients today have a lot of choices when it comes to IBD treatments. Dr. Conagetti, can you share with us some of the currently available options for IBD medications for adults with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and just before I do, of course, we want to take a step back and remember our treatment goals, um, achieving clinical remission where our patients, you know, get well, stay well, they're not dependent on steroids, and then endoscopic or mucosal healing. You might have heard of these terms from your doctor, but essentially it just means that the inflammation on the inside is gone, and we assess that um, typically through colonoscopy and labs. Um, so with our treatment, um, we're fortunate to have a lot of choices nowadays. Um, they're really focused on reducing inflammation, and so we categorize them based on their mechanism of action, that is, the specific inflammatory pathways they target. 
For our adult patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, we do have what are called biologic therapies. These are antibody-based therapies and they're cat categorized as anti-TNFs, anti-integrins and anti-IL-23s, again, just based on their mechanism. Uh, for patients with moderate to severe UC, we do also have two classes of oral medications, including JAK inhibitors and S1P receptor modulators. I know that's a mouthful, um, but these are also currently under study for Crohn's. Um, and then for our patients with mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, we do use misalamines. Um, and sometimes we consider this class of drugs for our patients with milder versions of Crohn's. All right, thank you. And what about for our pediatric patients? Dr. Huang, what are currently the most commonly prescribed treatments for our younger population? Um, so as Dr. Kanajetti mentioned, a lot of our therapies are directed really at the type of disease patients have, particularly in regards to severity. And in pediatrics, we have the similar class of medications for our more mild to moderate um, disease um, patients, both in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, but for the kind of more moderate to severe um, disease categories, um, we do only have a couple of FDA approved medications for the biologics in the anti-TNF categories, um, being infliximab and, uh, and uh, adalimumab, so Remicade and Humira, for those of you who might know those names instead. Um, but regardless, actually, we can still obtain some of the other newer agents. It just does take a little bit more time. We do have to work closely with patients as well as with their insurance um, and also with patients to kind of determine what kind of medications they want and what route they're willing to receive it in order to kind of get um, those medications for our patients. Um, so it is really a big conversation between families and our pediatric providers as to what is the best medication for them, particularly in their scenario. So I think really just partnering as well as you can with your healthcare provider will really kind of get you um, to the best class of medications um, for your situation. Uh, in general, oh, oh, sorry, just one more thing is this, um, although our pediatric FDA approvals do kind of run behind. Again, we can still get a hold of these medications. Um, and again, we are we do have a number of pediatric trials that are open. So it's kind of a great way to kind of also um, provide more access to medications. So again, we do also promote a number of um, participations in our clinical trials. Thank you. And so I'll move on to our second key point. Um, and Dr. Huang, I'll actually come right back to you. So in what directions are medications heading over the next year for our pediatric patients? And can you share with us a little bit more about the treat-to-target approach? So again, we are, um, we are um, increasingly uh, engaging our patients in clinical trials. So a lot of the exciting advances seen in the adults are now becoming available to um, children as well, um, particularly through clinical trials. Um, we are uh, also kind of looking at similar to, as Dr. Kanajetti mentioned, um, really mucosal healing, again, looking through endoscopy to make sure that um, how great patients are feeling outside is also similar to how they're looking on the inside. This has really kind of changed the way in which we've often thought about inflammatory bowel disease in children. Oftentimes, the natural history for inflammatory bowel disease has been for the disease to progress and for our patients to unfortunately suffer such consequences of having strictures and requiring surgeries. And really, I think this new target of having mucosal healing, so really kind of almost looking inside with a repeat endoscopy to really almost, we often call it just brand new gut. It looks just completely normal. And when we do achieve that, we find that we can push off some of the prior consequences that we saw before. And also we won't see kind of the um, kind of severity of disease or reduced quality of life as we had seen in the past. So it really is an exciting time, I think, for inflammatory bowel disease, both in the pediatric and the adult arenas. And so again, I think access to these new medications really is kind of changing the landscape of how our patients are um, able to really kind of enjoy their lifestyles kind of moving forward. Thank you. So since we know that new medications often start with our adult patients, Dr. Konajedi, what do you see in the treatment pipeline for our older population over the next year or so? So there are a lot of medications um, in phase one, two, and three trials. Um, the 
the trials that are in phase two and three um, do overlap with a lot of our currently approved therapies in terms of mechanism of action, but there are therapies that they're looking at that do target um, other inflammatory molecules. Um, when it comes to drug therapies, people are also looking at various combinations of drugs, um, especially during that injection or initial phase where we really want to get the inflammation under control. And then we're also evaluating maintenance strategies for keeping the inflammation under control, um, ideally with agents that have a, a better long-term safety profile. Um, but outside of just targeting inflammatory pathways, um, there are other um, approaches in the treatment uh, pipeline, including targeting the microbiome, um, diet and nutrition, the gut-brain access, stem cell therapies, um, especially for patients with fistulas, and then also regulating fibrosis or scarring um, to decrease the chances of complications. All right, and now on to our third key question. Since IBD is a chronic and progressive condition, treatment early on in this disease course is essential. So before we take questions from our audience, from your experience, what do you see as the future of IBD treatment? Uh, Dr. Konajedi, I'll start with you. Um, so that's a great question, you know, and I think one of the biggest limitations we have uh, in the world of IBD is not knowing what drug or even what treatment approach in general is gonna work for what patient. And then of course, when we find a medication that works, we wanna keep it working. Um, in terms of looking at the future of IBD treatment, you know, I think long-term we need precision medicine. Um, so really looking at various sources of data in individuals' genetics, their inflammatory profile, their environment, lifestyle, to really understand what approaches to treatment would be best for them. Um, you know, right now we really just look at what they've tried, um, what their journey has been, where they are now, and the risk factor for complications. But I think if, if we can integrate multiple streams of information, uh, we might be able to come up with better treatment approaches that are more effective. And then I guess I'll just add one more thing. Um, even now, integrating nutrition, diet, and lifestyle behaviors can help to reduce the overall burden of inflammation and improve our patient's quality of life. And so I think incorporating that more in practice is helpful. Awesome. Dr. Huang, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, I think um, just kind of emphasizing again, the need to kind of take a 360 approach, I think for our patients, um, again, not focusing so much only on medication, but also recognizing you know, other contributing factors like stress. I mean, we are doing a lot in regards to really screening for behavioral health issues in regards to depression and anxiety and wanting to provide support there as well to families. Um, again, recognizing that, you know, patients' interactions with their environment is so important, both kind of internal environments with the microbiome and external kind of through diet, nutrition, as well as physical activity are really important in terms of improving the quality of life of patients. Um, and again, just recognizing that as with any chronic disease, we really can't treat the disease in a vacuum because patients really kind of, um, you know, bring their own situations to everything. And we really kind of need to be in full conversation with them to know kind of what is the best way to um, manage, right, the symptoms that they have, what is the best mechanism to treat them, um, and what, it, what can they incorporate into their life without kind of too much, you know, too many issues. Um, and so kind of really wanting to make sure that we're always keeping an eye for um, the patient, of course, but also everything around that patient will really allow us to provide the best management plan for them moving forward. All right. So thank you, Dr. Konajedi and Dr. Huang for weighing in on those key questions. And now that we've reached about the halfway mark of today's session, I think we can start taking some direct questions from our audience. So just a reminder, if you have a question for one of our experts, please type it in the Q&A box, which is in the lower part of your screen. All right, we have a question to both. I'll read it out loud. Um, so you've mentioned that the goal of medications is to manage symptoms and achieve a deeper mission. Is there research into medication for a cure to IBD? I'll start with you, um, Dr. Huang. 
Uh, that's a great question. I mean, we are always, um, so the lines of research into inflammatory bowel disease are actually quite comprehensive. It's not just always medications to um, look at kind of how do patients respond, but there's actually also a fair amount of basic science research that is also happening. Um, and that's really kind of looking at mechanisms that lead to increased inflammations, maybe mechanisms that predispose to inflammation. Um, and it is that kind of area of research that we hope will lead ultimately to a cure. We haven't found it yet. And so we are really kind of, um, at least in the clinical arena, more directed towards symptom management at this time and also trying to reduce risk for complications in the future. Um, but of course, you know, kind of making sure that we have research lines in parallel, both clinical and basic science, as well as translational, which kind of crosses those two, um, we hope will lead to a cure someday. We're just not there yet. Dr. Konajedi, did you want to jump in? Um, I would agree with everything Dr. Huang has said. You know, I, I think if you think about what leads to inflammatory bowel disease, you know, it's it's disruptions in our gut microbiome, um, changes, you know, our genetics, and then various environmental uh, exposures and factors, really just that culminate into chronic inflammation. Um, it's not necessarily just one insult, you know, which does make cure a lot more challenging. Um, but research is really looking at all of these mechanisms. And again, I think what someone needs to get into remission uh, may not necessarily be what they need to sustain that remission. And so hopefully we can also find better ways to sustain remission that really minimizes risk, um, you know, and doesn't affect quality of life for our patients. Hmm. All right, so we have a question now about treatment options for mild Crohn's. Um, so the question is just, uh, what are the options available for the patients? And I think I'll start with our, maybe our adult population, Dr. Conagetti. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, that is probably the least studied um, phenotype, if you will, of our patients uh, who have Crohn's. There's been a lot more research in moderate to severe disease, but I do think that we have um, approaches and recommendations that are helpful. So from a drug therapy standpoint, um, we can use steroids, of course, especially weak or locally acting steroids to help get patients into remission. Um, but of course, we don't want to use those long term. For some patients, though, getting them into remission may be all they need, and they may be able to sustain that remission off of medications. Um, for certain patients, depending on where their Crohn's disease is located, you know, whether small intestine, large intestine, or both, we may consider the use of drugs like mesalamine or sulfasalazine as well. And then in general, um, there is, you know, some data to suggest that um, there are dietary factors that can help. Um, the International Organization for IBD issued guidelines in 2020 that really advocates for a Mediterranean style diet. So lots of vegetables and fruits, um, healthy fats, and really, you know, to that extent, healthy proteins um, to help reduce not just inflammation, but also symptoms in our patient. And I think we're seeing that in a, our adult patients, um, that that really does help uh, reduce inflammation. Um, other things that can help reduce inflammation and potentially keep Crohn's really mild or something that, you know, that doesn't require medical therapy are things like avoiding chronic NSAID use. So avoiding chronic use of things like ibuprofen, um, naproxen, and so forth. Um, Tylenol is, is certainly fine. And um, also avoiding tobacco. So tobacco does tend to increase inflammation it can lead to a variety of complications, especially in our patients with Crohn's. Um, and then getting enough sleep, like Dr. Huang rec um, mentioned, you know, really stress control and management of stress. All of these things can help reduce inflammation. And, you know, I think can be used really at any stage of IBD, whether mild, moderate, or severe. But I think for that mild patient, it's really helpful to think about these things so that perhaps it might prevent them from progressing too. Thank you. Um, Dr. Huang, do you want to add anything for our pediatric population? 
Um, so in pediatrics, one of the therapies that we have tried, particularly for small bowel Crohn's on the milder side, um, has been actually enteral nutrition therapy, which you know I know can be sometimes a difficult thing um, to contemplate maybe on the adult side, but it's basically formula only therapy. Um, and this has actually been very effective to control um, actually a lot of the inflammation that we see and actually um, bring patients into remission. It, of course, does not have any toxicity being formula only. And so it is actually very attractive um, in that sense. But of course, the limitation of taking only formula and really no other foods can be actually um, quite a deterrent for many patients as well. Um, we can, in some patients, actually wean that down a little bit, so it's not literally 100% formula, but it is always going to be majority um, formula. So um, for it does take some dedication for families because when we do um, withdraw from that, then the flare unfortunately will happen. But it is a you know it is an effective mode of therapy, and for many patients, um, particularly for younger patients, it's something that they can tolerate, and of course then they can um, thrive and grow. And so uh, because of its low toxicity profile, can be quite attractive. Yeah. And I'd just like to add, you know, enteral nutrition is probably the most effective form of nutritional therapy we have um, when it comes to inducing remission. But, you know, it's, of course, just the hardest to tolerate um, and hasn't been as successful in our adult population because it's really hard to go on a liquid based diet for four to eight weeks. Um, but there is a lot of good research out there on more specialized diets, um, some of which incorporate partial enteral nutrition. So maybe part of your diet is liquid based and the other part is um, a little more specialized. Um, and then there are also diets that try to recreate the effects of enteral nutrition, um, but using table foods directly. So I think there's a lot of great work in this. And, um, you know, again, just like drugs, you know, I think we have to individualize the approach to nutrition and diet for our patients too. All right, thank you. So kind of along the same similar lines, uh, Dr. Kanajiti, you have a question that says, you mentioned the microbiome. Um, so they were wondering, are there any treatments available that directly target the microbiome? So not at this point. Um, there are no currently FDA approved therapies to treat Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, we do sometimes use probiotics uh, for our patients who have a J pouch and have issues with pouchitis. Um, sometimes we also use antibiotics, you know, which also target the microbiome. Um, there have been studies of fecal transplant, so infusing uh, fecal contents from a healthy donor into patients, especially who have ulcerative colitis. That's where all the trials have really been. And these are patients with mild to moderate UC. Um, the trials have largely suggested a benefit, um, but there's just been a lot of issues to really understand, you know, which way should we give it? How often should we give it? Is this going to be something they only need once or do they need this on an ongoing basis? You know, what are the risks? Do we have a super donor, <laughs> you know, who might um, help patients achieve remission compared to other donors where the stool may not be as effective? So, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions, um, but people are still looking into this as a treatment option as well. And I think there is some exciting actually movement in regards to fecal transplant, that, because again, we do use this for therapy for um, recurrent C. difficile infections and things like that. So not necessarily inflammatory bowel disease per se at this time. Um, but there are some exciting developments in regards to a commercial product that might be coming available. And so, um, you know, I think it's a field to watch um, kind of moving into the future. And again, right now in terms of for inflammatory bowel disease, again, there are research studies that are happening. And again, we, we hope to learn a lot from those as well. So again, wonderful opportunities for patients to participate in kind of the research that's happening as well as kind of adding to the body of knowledge on which we base our treatments. So great time. Got it. And another question for you, Dr. Conagetti. Um, there have been some patients that have been in remission for extended periods of time, um, some even like 30 plus years, as mentioned. Um, are, is there any ability to get off medications completely while staying in remission? Yeah, um, that is a great question. And I think that's definitely something you want to talk to your doctor about. Um, you know, when, when I think about 
this the top this is the topic of de-escalation um, and it can really refer to any medication you're on um, but we do have data on de-escalation even for our patients who are on biologics especially the anti-tnfs in general if a, a patient is relatively low risk for complications if they haven't had a super aggressive disease course you know if they haven't gone through most of our medications and I'm kind of worried about whether or not we'll have treatment options. So kind of that patient who I think will succeed. We will have this discussion about de-escalation. Now, ideally, I'd really like if they were in, you know, deep remission, so clinical remission, endoscopic healing for a period of, you know, a couple of years, just so I know that they've done well and stayed well. So if you've been in remission for 30 years, you know, I think it's definitely worth having this discussion. Um, and then we can consider a trial of stopping the medication. Um, for our biologic therapies, typically we just stop it. You know, we don't taper patients off. The issue though that people need to know is, you know, at this point, there's about a 40 to 50% chance of relapse at one to two years after stopping the medication. So nowadays, because of all these treatment options we have, um, that might be an acceptable risk to some patients, but for others, I've brought it up, but they just remember how bad and, you know, how severe their disease was, and they never want to risk that. Um, so I think it's a shared decision. Um, if patients do um, stop therapy, I still recommend monitoring the exact same way that I would if they were on drugs. So I really want to make sure that their labs, their stool tests remain normal, um, and you know, do that follow-up colonoscopy at some point just to make sure that healing uh, persists on the inside as well. Thank you. Oh, did you want to jump in, Dr. Hall? Yeah, I just wanted to um, touch base regards in regards to de-escalation or withdrawal of therapy in pediatric patients. Um, do you want to point out that pediatric IBD is not the same as adult IBD? We um, pediatric IBD is actually quite inflammatory in nature, um, and so um, you know, in when it, when you look at a lot of the trials for de-escalation, increased risk for flare or disease relapse is actually younger age at initial presentation, so that automatically includes our pediatric age group. So I just wanted to point that out. The other thing that I would just say is that for many of us in pediatrics, we often, you know, once we've um, achieved remission in patients, uh, we often don't want to consider de-escalation until they are fully grown. Uh, because again, our growth plates are only open for a certain period of time. We cannot reopen them once they're closed. And so if we take that period of time in patients flare, and that is often a um, a wonderful inhibitor of growth. Um, if that then growth plate closes, we cannot re-achieve kind of, uh, you know, growth again. Should we re-attain uh, remission on repeat therapy? So oftentimes we will not consider a, a withdrawal of medication or de-escalation until patients have achieved their final height. So just wanted to give those caveats in regards to those considerations in pediatrics. Yeah, I guess I'll just add, that's really helpful to, to hear, you know, because treating the adult population, we don't necessarily face those same um, issues. But I have seen patients, especially in their late teens, early 20s, who did have issues with growth. Um, and when they got into remission, interestingly enough, they did get a little taller, um, you know, and, and, and put on weight and um, even went through some changes consistent with puberty related changes. And so, um, so I think that's a very valid point. You know, we want them to have, um, be able to mature in that way um, and physically develop as well. All right. Thank you guys so much. So um, thank you. That was a great discussion. And I really hope everyone was able to learn some helpful information today. So uh, I'm really sorry, but that is almost all the time we have today. And I'd just like to take a little bit of time to wrap up. Um, so currently, we are very fortunate to have many treatment options available for both adult and pediatric IBD patients. And the focus of these medications is on the long-term goal of achieving remission and reducing further complications. And it's been really exciting to learn today that several medications are currently in phase two and three trials, 
and that studies are being conducted into combining medications, maintenance strategies, and even stem cell therapies. So our hope is that in the years to come, precision medicine, as it was mentioned, which is a more personalized type of medicine, can offer a more tailored approach to treatment and achieving remission. So just one thing, I do want to say thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your busy day to join us here. Uh, I know that for myself as an IVD patient, having these sessions where we can gather as a community and learn some really important things about this condition is really special. And I hope today's program has been helpful and informative to all of you in some way. So on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, we encourage you to keep learning about IVD and to visit some of these helpful educational resources listed on the screen. And so just some final things before we go, if you wanna watch previous webinars and expert conversations, please visit that link, www.cronescolitisfoundation.org slash learning. And I also want to remind everybody really quick to please fill out the evaluation survey that's gonna be sent out to you after today's program. We really, really appreciate the feedback and it helps us plan future programming. Um, and so with that, I wanna thank all of you again for joining today's My IBD Learning Virtual Program. IBD medications now and beyond. Thanks for your time and have a great rest of your evening, everyone.